Welcome to another virtual author chat at the Poison Pen Bookstore. I am John Charles, and today the Poison Pen is honored to have with us retired Major General Mary, Mary Kay Eater, whose new book is The Girls Who Fight, Fought Crime. Before we begin, I'd like to let those tuning in know that the Poison Pen does have copies of the book on order, and we would be happy to hold one for you or put one in the mail. Just give us a call or go online to the Poison Pen Bookstore. Now I'd like to welcome Mary. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you for taking time to join us today virtually. Um, why don't we start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself before you became a published writer. You have decades of distinguished service in the military, but it all started in a small town in Pennsylvania. That's true. I grew up in a very small town and went to the University of Edinburgh in Pennsylvania and then joined the Army thinking I would work there for a few years and then go on to do something else. Like many things, that's not exactly how it worked out. But I've always been a writer, whether it's writing press releases or feature stories, reports. So you write in different styles. And my first couple of books were written while I was still in the Army. And these were stress relievers. These were stories in the voice of my dog, uh, two of those books. And then several on communications. But when I retired, I wanted to write crime fiction being the fav my favorite thing really so yes your bookstore website is a candy store for me well that's good to hear <laughs> um you retired from the military you decided you wanted to write uh, thrillers and crime novels but you discovered it wasn't as easy as you thought i discovered i wasn't as good at it as i thought <laughs> <clears throat> i'm still working at it and still hope to get there but it was a change for me to really write conversation and in ways that are, well, conversational, much more so than what I was used to. So I think that has been probably my biggest challenge, but I'm, I'm getting there. Well, if I understand correctly, after you retired, you were asked to speak at an event, and that kind of prompted your first girl's book for source books. Well, the first book, actually, it started, yes, when I was asked to speak at an Army event on leadership, and this was in 2017, I had been reading obituaries. I know that sounds a little odd, but I've been reading stories of members of the greatest generation who continue to pass now in ever greater numbers. And as I found this one story, I was just amazed by it, saved it didn't know what I was going to do with it, talked about it at this session. But when in 2019, I heard Alex Borstein accept the award for the Emmy Award for her role in Mrs. Maisel, and she talked about her grandmother in World War II, I thought, that's what I need to do with these. Let's put them all together. And the more I did that, the more I found connections between them. Oh. And I still continue to. And that was the book, The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line? Yes. And it all featured women from the World War II kind of era. It did. One but it also led me to this book. Which is The Girls Who Fought Crime. And what would you like to tell us about that book? Well, one of my friends who lives in Florida said to me, well, that book was good, but you really need to write about my husband's grandmother. So what about your husband's grandmother? Well, she was a cop in New York City in 1915. And I was already hooked. Tell me more. <laughs> so it's the story. So she gave me the newspaper clippings and some of the stories about the things um, May Foley had done. And I was definitely up for writing more about that and learning more about her. She was a fascinating character. And you put a lot of information into the book. She really did a lot. Can you talk a little bit? One of the things that intrigued me was she was part of a masher squad. <clears throat> I think New York, <clears throat> for what New York City did with its police department, was copied by many other major metropolitan police departments early in the century. And they created a masher squad with the early police women to patrol the subways and the streets around Times Square and near Broadway and look out for mashers, men who annoyed women, is how they called it, um, would pretend to fall on them during the, in the subways or get too close or into outright assaults. 
And so it was called the Masher Squad, and she enjoyed that for doing that work for several years. One of the little details that she put into that particular incident was that the women in that squad were trained in Japanese wrestling moves. I thought that was fascinating. It surprised me as well that that was part of the early training for police women. They were all trained in jujitsu and they were able to take down, as the director put it, a, any man over, over six feet tall and 250 pounds, they could take him down. Um, another one of May's um, projects, not projects, but one of her assignments was the three X murders. What can you tell us about that? The three X murders were quite famous. as they, They've never been solved. Oh. There's still articles about them on various crime sites. And after the second murder, May was then living in Queens. So she was in the 108th Precinct, which is the area where the murders took place. And Queens was pretty much rural at that time. Um, not as much development. There were lots of quiet areas and the murders had taken place in lover's lanes mm -hmm. near to a university, but also close to an, a sane asylum, which is some of the speculation now that it was someone who had escaped from there. So she was assigned to be bait for the serial killer along with another detective. So they sat in the parked car at night and waited to be accosted. And mm -hmm. they were by someone who wanted to rob them and it mm -hmm. was not the murderer. Um, another project that she um, became involved in the assignment was fascinating because I don't think a lot of people, at least I didn't really realize the interest in Germany in World War II and infiltrating the United States. I know there's been some books written about it, um, especially California was, I guess, one hotbed of German spies, but May also became involved because the German-American Bund was active in New York. It was very active in the 1930s. There were summer camps for kids. <clears throat> there were parades. Um, and there were probably several hundred members of the NYPD who were members of the Bund, wow. too, which was quite interesting. And there were several groups who actually, in the late 1930s and into the war, came to the U.S., landed in Long Island and then on a beach in Florida and attempted to infiltrate into the country and then sabotage manufacturing plants. But her job was to go undercover. And this was at a, a time of change rather than wait for an incident to occur and arrest people. It was an intelligence gathering. It wasn't very pleasant for her. She didn't like being a member of the Nazi movement, but she yeah. learned quite a bit about it. Another thing that she mentioned um, that I think was pertinent to the women um, officers in the police force was the three eyes, insight, um, investigative ability, and instinct were those qualities that women particularly had to hone. Yes, I think in the beginning, it was more of the instinct. <clears throat> and it wasn't exactly a, a positive attribute. It was, well, women make good actresses, so they can go undercover and no one will suspect them. And that was the first two detectives in the NYPD going back to 1911 and 1912, I believe. Hmm. You give us a good um, picture of May, but you also, you know, her professional life, but you also talk about her personally because she had to balance both worlds. She had a family, she had children. Um, one thing I found fascinating was she was such an um, She's such a fan of world travel. I never would have thought of that. I think it, you would might call it escapism. Okay. Um, <clears throat> probably her vacation time was three weeks a year. So there was time to take an ocean voyage. She always went first class, sometimes with her Broadway friends and sometimes with some of her police women friends. Her husband wasn't interested in doing this, and he passed away in 1928. But she continued to travel up until... The beginning of World War II when it was no longer safe and all of the ships were being appropriated for use by the Navy. Um, so she would go first class. She would pretend she was oh, royalty or an heiress. And it was a great, a great way to just be away totally. Yeah, because she did have a stressful job and a stressful home life at times. Um, can we talk a little bit about the research for this book? Because it must have been challenging if what I read was correct. 
a lot of the records, the police records, when they moved buildings, the early records were thrown away. Um, you didn't have access to archives. There was no police archive. How did you go about researching May? What sources did you find? You do a wonderful job because you've got an excellent bibliography. You cite all your sources. How did you get them? Well, the NYPD did throw away all of their files before 1930 ah. into the East River when they moved. The department does not have a historian, and they have <clears throat> stopped answering FOIA requests for historical information, even if you say, this is my, my friend's grandmother, can I get an information on her awards and commendations? Hmm. They don't respond. It became too overwhelming. So <clears throat> my main research was done at the New York Public Library some of it in person, some of it online, uh, National Archives. And there, is also some, there are also some wonderful websites. There was a museum in New York, which closed during COVID. But the newspapers of the time are also a great resource because there were hundreds of them, morning, noon, and night. Yeah. And I have several examples of what I would call early memes. <laughs> uh, there was one incident where May was attacked by a prisoner. She was frisking. And one newspaper that was a little more factual showed a mugshot of May and a mugshot of the criminal. Another one made it into a meme in which May is choking the, the bad person to death, which is kind of a, you know, a big leap, I thought, at the time. But I continued to find much more politics in the stories than I would have expected and much more exaggeration. So I had to constantly compare different articles to get at the basic truth. Were you able to interview any any real people as part of the project for the book? Not anyone who would have remembered her mm -hmm. or even I will I am sure I will find that. Just as with the earlier book that after it was published, I continue to meet people who knew the people in it, knew the women I had written about, who were their neighbors, their friends, family members. And the connect had connections. So I'm certain I will meet people who had some connections with her or some of her contemporaries. She retired in 1945 wow. and passed away in 1967. So I might find people who knew about the funeral because it was a large funeral in New York. The entire department apparently turned out the pipes, pipes and drums came and played. So I, I'm sure I'll find people about who knew about her. She was an amazing figure. Um, what surprised you the most about May when you were researching her? I think that she was so matter of fact about everything. Oh. Um, this, is, this is just how it is, and I have to do this, and I will do it, and I will do it well. She didn't seek any promotion. She didn't seek to be political. She had seen people who were political and who um, perhaps stepped a little too far in some of the things they said or did and were transferred or faced a downgrade and were punished for it. And she did her job. She was quiet about it. And she just didn't make any, any political waves within the department. Now I have one of the pictures in the book is from the 108th precinct, because by the 1930s, it was a a big symbol of prestige to have that in the precinct house, a picture of all of the members of the force there. Of course, by then there were too many of them to get them all together. So they're individual portraits. And May's the only woman there. Wow. So of course she realizes she can't be the one who's squeamish or refuse to take on a job or say, I don't want to frisk a dead body or I don't want to go to this event. And so she did it all and she did it uncomplainingly. And then she would go on a cruise. <laughs> um, May and the women that worked with her really were, I guess you'd say, tough cookies in a sense. Um, you write about one, another character. I think it was Edna Picnic or something like that. Edna Pitkin. Pitkin. Yeah. yeah, who, just matter of fact, they said that she tested a bulletproof vest for one of the people by wearing it, having somebody shoot her, shoot at her. And I'm thinking, good heavens. And it was a, a Broadway star. So she was a little bit of a loose cannon, May would think. And please don't tell my husband about this because I'm working on him so I can join the force permanently. So don't tell him you volunteered to do this. Mm -hmm. And then would say, what's why? What's wrong with that? It didn't hurt at all. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, they were amazing. Um, you said something in the book, and I'm going to paraphrase it a bit, so correct me if I get it wrong, but a lot of people back then and people today even think that the police, military, or even the military are no place for a woman. But you write that actually the truth is that the solution to some of the problems facing um, policing in the U.S. today is to include more women because they help make the police force a better place. Can you kind of expand on that? Sure. I looked at some of the research from Columbia University, and there's a project called 30 by 30 to try to increase police, women police by 30 percent by 2030, because research has shown that when women are involved in incidents, there is less chance of violence and more opportunities for better outcomes. May and many of her contemporaries came into policing from social work. So their focus was not putting the force into the police force, but in protecting the vulnerable, the at risk, to looking out for them for scams or for how people were taken advantage of. And it, the focus was more on community than it was on being forceful against criminals. If that was necessary, you know, when the jujitsu training was there, and yes, they did have their revolvers, <clears throat> then she could do that. But if it wasn't necessary, why go there? That's true. Um, let's talk a little bit about you as a writer and your process. I'm guessing, and I could be wrong, but because you have a background in writing communications and PR and things like that from the military, that that kind of helped you write what I'm calling narrative nonfiction, because you're taking a topic and kind of introducing it to readers who might not be familiar with it. I think that's true. Not, not only that, but I want to write some history pieces in ways that make it interesting and new to another generation, okay. rather than simply the narrative, but without the conversational aspect to it. I want to make these be real people and not just figures back there when everything is brown or in black and white. As a writer, do you have a set schedule? Did When you're working on the book, do you try to, to set certain guidelines, mileposts, benchmarks? Do you write as inspiration comes? I'm sure research is a big part of your job. Well, I think it was Maya Angelou who said that if you show up every day and you try to write, even if it you are not inspired that sooner or later the muse will say, hmm, well, she's working at it. We'll show up today. <laughs> and <clears throat> so there are some days when I can't write the inspired pieces or uh, good, good conversational aspects. And so I'll do the mundane pieces, work on the bibliography or do, but I will do something every day. Good. And I will write usually every afternoon. Are you working on something right now? I know you've just turned in, this book has just been published or will be published, but have you started another project and do you want to say anything about it or keep it under wraps? Well, there are the two fiction books that my agent has oh. and hopefully can do something with. <clears throat> there is a proposal for another book in this series, which would be about sports. Oh, that's great. Uh, women's sports figures. And I never intended to write this. Again, I wanted to write history and, and crime and thrillers. So my next, the one I am working on right now is the story of a Russian trader in World War II and how that laid out and affected U.S. military history. So there is an advantage to having all of this military background. So I can read about the weapons go, no, that's not how that weapon worked. <laughs> or... I'm sure it does come in handy. I'm guessing being having been part of the military for so long, discipline comes um, second nature to you too. So you can get into that as a writer. Yes, and it's hard to boss yourself around. It really is. <laughs> um, at, as a reader, you mentioned that crime fiction was a passion. Has that always been something that you've read? Do you have particular favorite books that you think those are kind of inspirational to you as a reader and a writer? Who are some of the authors that you look forward to reading? Well, I was in Germany in the early 1980s, and that one of the first books I read there was Robert Ludlum, Oh, and it was The Odessa File, and I was hooked after that on spy stories. <clears throat> so I have read all of Ludlum. Um, now I will read anything by John Sanford, Jonathan Kellerman, 
Um, I see Daniel Silva is coming and I will read, I've read all of those. And so I always now look at the style, not, you know, you can watch a movie or read a book where you, you focus on how it is packaged and put together and it takes away the enjoyment. I want to have all of the enjoyment and yet understand how it was prepared at the same time. And I do that now. So you're not only looking at it as entertainment, but also a source of information to you as a writer, a source of inspiration. Or... Yes. And if it is one of those in my favorite lineup, I will romp through that in about two and a half days and then be <laughs> sad it's over. Okay. So those are my rewards after I've been writing. <laughs> well, it's good to have some kind of schedule of treats and rewards for anything in life. Um, gosh, now I forgot what I was going to. Oh. No, I still forgot. Well, we'll go on to another question. Um, you've been writing now for a while. When you first started out, if you could go back and tell yourself something, give yourself a piece of advice, what would you say to the young Mary as she was starting out as a writer? You should have been writing all along. You should have been writing from age 17 onward. And to some extent I was, but not with the same discipline because some of the jobs I had in the military were all consuming. And I don't think that if you permit yourself to be consumed totally by the daily requirements of whatever you're involved in, if it's not totally something you are inspired by yourself, you find it just eats time. And so I would give myself that advice. And I would also tell myself, give yourself time with this. When I retired, I said, well, I'm going to going to do this and I'm going to have five years. And if I'm not successful, I'll quit. Hmm. Well, it took eight years, but I don't quit once I get started. And by then I was I had learned enough about the process, the business, the whole having an agent and how that worked. And then I was like, OK, I'm figuring this out now and I'm going to get better at it. That's a very smart approach to it. What has surprised you the most about the business of publishing? That it's a glacier. I want to be one of those people in publishing who, well, we don't we don't take any submissions from for three months. Really, that's a nice vacation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, traditional publishing does have its um, interesting quirks, I guess you'd say. To that, have you ever thought about doing in indie publishing? going out on your own? Well, my books are all different kinds. So the dog books I did um, self-published, which oh, taught nice. me layout design and editing myself so I could do each phase and do them, do them better than just writing. So mm -hmm. it made me learn every aspect of how the books are prepared. With the communications book, each one has a different business type publisher. So I learned how that worked. I am still not an expert in the um, style books. And I find that to be the, the drudgery piece of it all, but hopefully I'm getting better at that too. It's a learning curve. Um, how can readers learn more about your books? Are you on social media? Do you have a website? I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Okay. I talk about books and dogs oh. in, in all places, and I do have a website. And your website is? Uh, MaryKayEater.com or Benson's Review, which is the name of my dog. Oh, how cute. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with those tuning in about the girls who fought crime? I think that most people have said to me, I didn't know people, women were even in the police force that early. And I said, well, it's true. And, and I kept looking for more of them. And at one point I found the 1933 uh, city ledger of city employees, and it listed all of the women, the police women. There's hundreds, but you'll not find any information on any more than one or two of them. I found so much more information available and accessible in the World War II era. And the further back you go, the more difficult it is. Is that just because, it, just because things disappear, things aren't kept? Um in archives or things like that, or we just, they just didn't care at that point in time, or it wasn't important. There, I think it's all of it. It's all of the above. Um, there are annual reports, but they don't have specifics or names. 
Uh, the police department did an annual report to the mayor and has, I think, since the beginning of the 20th century. Okay. But you don't see much in there about the people who were part of the department. It's more about the the motor transport unit, the equestrian unit, the band, the ball teams, and the statistics on arrests. That's fascinating. Well, this has just been delightful. Um, Mary's new book is The Girls Who Fought Crime. It's if you enjoy nonfiction, if you just like a good story, it's a fascinating tale of one woman and the other females who helped her fight crime in New York City. I'd like to thank Mary for taking time to virtually visit with the Poison Pen. I'd like to thank those listening in. We do have copies of both um, books by Mary. We'd be happy to hold them for you or put them in the mail. They're a terrific summer read or any time of the year. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. And I hope to get to visit there in October and I will bring a second suitcase. <laughs> we would love to have you. And thank you for tuning into another virtual author chat at the Poison Pen Bookstore.